Uh, Vespero, can we ask for a blessing for the reading session? Blessed is our God, now and ever, now to ages of ages. Amen. The commentaries of Archbishop Averki on the four Gospels. The language of the New Testament books and their textual history. All the books of the New Testament were written in Greek, but not in classical Greek. Rather, they were written in a local Alexandrian dialect of the Greek language, so-called Kini Greek, which was the universally spoken, or at least universally understood, cultural language of not only the eastern, but also the western halves of the Roman Empire at that time. This was the language of all the educated people of the time. The apostles chose this language for that reason, so that the New Testament books would be understandable and accessible for all educated citizens of the Roman Empire. They were written either by the hand of the author or by scribes to whom the authors dictated, on Egyptian papyrus with ink and stylus. Parchment was used much more rarely since it was prepared from the skins of animals and was thus very costly to make. It is characteristic that only capital uh, letters of the Greek alphabet were used. There were no punctuation marks and no spaces separating words. Small letters only began to be used in the 9th century, as were spaces between words. Punctuation marks were only introduced after the, after the invention of the printing press in the 16th century by Aldus Manutius. Today's division into chapters was only introduced in the West in the 13th century by Cardinal Hugo de Santo Carlo, while division into verses was introduced by the typographer Robert Stephanus of Paris in the 16th century. Through its learned bishops and priests, the Church has always tried to protect the text of the holy books from any corruption, which is always possible, especially before the invention of the printing press when books were copied by hand. There is evidence to suggest that corrupted texts were corrected by such learned Christian teachers as Origen, Hezekius of Egypt, and Lucian of Antioch. After the invention of the printing press, extra care was taken to make sure that the books of the New Testament would be printed only from the best ancient manuscripts. In the first quarter of the 16th century, two printed Greek New Testaments appeared almost simultaneously. The so-called complu... Complutensian, oh, okay, sorry. The so-called Complutensian polyglot in Spain, an Erasmus's edition printed in Basel. It's uh, I'm probably not saying that right at all. It's B A S E L, Basel, Basel, Basel. Yeah. It is also where? How do you say it? You said it right the last time. Basel, and whereabouts is Basel? It's in the north of Switzerland on the German and French border. Thank you. All right. It is also this. Is, sorry, this is how cultured. Uh, this is how cultured I am. Thank you, Aaron. Um, it is also very important to take note of the work of Constantine Tischendorf in this in the nineteenth century, who helped uncover more than nine hundred manuscripts of the New Testament. Wow. Both of these well-intentioned critical editions, as well as the untiring vigilance of the Church, which guided by the Holy Spirit that lives within it gives us more than enough reasons to be sure that we have in our time the pure uncorrupted Greek uh, the pure uncorrupt uncorrupted Greek text of the New Testament that's the end of the this little chapter um, do we have any questions before we move on yes I have one question go for it so he mentions origin and I know that origin has been denounced by one of the councils I don't know which one but he is one of these heretics who is not completely denounced by by everyone, right? I mean, I just read uh, the four dialogues by um, Dr. Vladimir Moss, and even he um, quotes Origen in a way. And and here we have Bishop Archbishop Averki also mentioning origin and not in a negative way so can you just say a few words on you know origin and what we are to think of him uh, origin was a, a complex figure he was probably at the um he went through two phases he there was the phase before he was a heretic and during that time um he was the most celebrated a spiritual father of his day, his advice to people um, made him sought after. Um, and he really did uh, give a lot to the church. 
I think his his life is summed up best though by Saint Simeon the Fool for Christ, who said that Origen decided to swim in the deep water and drowned. Uh, Origen got ahead of himself and started to um, to give theological interpretations that were not correct in order um, to have something new to say and. Um, so I think he got caught up in himself and that brought his downfall. Thank you, guys. But uh, Aaron, any, any follow up from you? No, thank you. In a way, in a way that's similar to Father Seraphim Rose. No, exactly, exactly. And there are, there are many others, uh, unfortunately, that we could divide their life into the time that they were really um offering a lot and then what they landed up becoming in the end what's the snare that these people fall into yarada where they where they fall off the cliff people do praise the good theologian they do praise the good um father of the church and so that um unfortunately we're human beings and praise is um something that's very dangerous to us so uh, perhaps the origin and other people started to think of themselves as invincible in matters of theology, uh, whereas theology touches God itself, we should be going there with awe, uh, but instead they start to teach things that uh, were their own simple thoughts and trying to make it a dogma of the church. Right. And Father Simeon told me that theology is exclusively the science of the humble. Exactly. It's dangerous for everybody else. So what should the, there must have, so that we have these fathers or we have these, these figures in church history that have fallen into this trap and they've had a very bad end after having a very good start or a very good middle. What what should they have done, Yerida, when they were receiving this glory from men? What what should they have done to avoid the fall? Somehow they lost track of their own sinfulness. And no matter what anyone says about us good, I mean, we have to see our own sins. As the psalmist David said, my sin is always before me. Uh, if we were really believed how sinful we were and how much we lack the the illumination of Christ, then we would never be able to fall that deeply. Right. So they, they shouldn't have believed what the people said about them in the first place? Uh, they should have balanced it with um, their own conscience, which sh certainly had lots of things that weren't good, like all of us. But that when that balance is lost, and I start believing the people that praise me, then I'm in trouble. Okay. Uh, and one more thing on on origin, Yerida. Is it is it true? I've, one thing I've heard, uh, an expression I've heard used to describe him is as the father of heretics. Um, does, is this actually is this actually true? Can we ascribe even Arianism and the heresies that came after it to to origin? I wouldn't be that harsh on origin, but. Um, yeah, I guess it's the the spirit of thinking we know it all that brings our downfall and brings about all heresy. Uh, heretics, first of all, suffer from pride, and that's why um, they won't go back when they've started as a rule. So pride is not only the thing that separates that keeps it keeps a person separate from the church from actually being able to join the true church. It's also it's also the thing that pulls a person away from the true church once they're in the ark. Certainly, certainly. Right. Okay. So let's um, let's get back in. So um, thank you for the question, Aaron. That's um, this is exactly what we want to. This is the kind of discussion that we want to have. When the New Testament was written, it is impossible to exactly determine the de the date of the writing of each book with perfect accuracy, but it's completely without doubt that all of them were written in the second half of the first century. This is clearly seen even in the fact that several writers of the 2nd century, such as Justin Martyr, Celsus, and especially St. Ignatius the God-bearer in his epistles, dated 
uh, dated to AD uh, to around about AD 107, cite the New Testament many times and quote it verbatim. The first New Testament books to be written were doubtless the epistles of the apostles, which were written in response to the necessity of confirming the faith of the newly established Christian communities. But soon, of course, there appeared a need for a systematic treatment of the earthly life of the Lord Jesus Christ and his teaching. No matter how much the negative criticism of the 19th century has tried to bring into doubt the historical authenticity and accuracy of our Gospels and other New Testament books, dating them to a much later time, um, F.C. Bauer and his school, for example, recent discoveries in the field of patristic literature witness clearly to the fact that the entire New Testament was written in the first century. In the beginning of our Gospel lectionary, in a special preface to each of the four Gospels, it is written, based on the witness of the church historian Eusebius and the famous interpreter of the scriptures Theophylact, Archbishop of Bulgaria, that the Gospel of Matthew was written eight years after the ascension of Christ, the Gospel of Mark ten years, the Gospel of Luke fifteen years, and the Gospel of John in the thirty-second year after the ascension. In any case, there is a whole list of reasons why we can safely determine that the Gospel according to Matthew was written before all the rest, no earlier than AD 50 to 60. The Gospels of Mark and Luke were written a little bit later, but certainly not before the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, while St. John wrote his Gospel last, at the end of the first century, already as an old man. Some people cite the year AD 96. He wrote the Apocalypse a few years earlier. The Acts of the Apostles were written soon after the Gospel according to Luke, since, as we see in its prologue, it was written as a continuation of the Gospel. Why are there exactly four Gospels? All four, all four Gospels tell us of the life and teaching of Christ the Saviour, his miracles, his passion on the cross, his death and burial, and his glorious resurrection from the dead and ascension into heaven. All four together fill in each other's gaps and help explain, explain difficult moments for interpretation. In fact, there is uh, in fact, they are one whole book that has no contradictions or lack of agreement in the most essential and important elements, in the teaching that being the teaching of salvation, which was accomplished by the incarnate Son of God, holy God and holy man. Early Christian writers compared the four Gospels to the river that flowed out of Eden for the watering of the garden planted by God, which divided into four rivers that flowed through the area around the garden, making the land full of all manner of precious fruit. An even more typical symbol for the four Gospels is the mystical chariot that the prophet Ezekiel saw at the river Chebar in Ezekiel chapter 1, and Ezekiel chapter 1, and which was made of four beings that looked like the faces of a man. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, I'll say that, go back a little bit, and which, uh, I'll say that sentence from the start. An even more typical symbol for the four Gospels is the mystical chariot that the prophet Ezekiel saw at the river Chebar and which was made of four beings that looked like the faces of a man, a lion, an ox, and an eagle. These beings, taken separately, became the emblems of the evangelists. Beginning in the 5th century, Christian iconography represented Matthew with a man or angel, St. Mark with a lion, St. Luke with an ox, and St. John with an eagle. St. Matthew was given the symbol of a man because his gospel especially accents Christ's human lineage from David and Abraham. St. Mark received the symbol of the lion because he especially underlines Christ's kingly power. St. Luke is given the ox, a sacrificial animal, because he speaks of Christ most of all as the great high priest who brought himself as a sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. St. John is associated with the eagle because his thoughts are especially exalted and his language is very majestic like the eagle that flies high above the earth, above the clouds of human weakness as St. Augustine. Hmm, as I'm going to say Blessed Augustine said. Besides the four canonical Gospels, the first century after Christ saw many, more than 50 other writings that called themselves Gospels and claimed apostolic provenance. This is what Father Joseph was talking about um, on our last stream about this. The Church, however, very quickly rejected them, relegating them to the list of the so-called Apocrypha. Even St. Irenaeus of Lyon, the disciple of St. Polycarp of Smyrna, who in his own turn was the disciple of St. John the Theologian, Wrote, wrote in his Against Heresies that there are only four Gospels and that there can be neither fewer nor more than four since there are four directions in the world and four winds in the universe. 
St. John Chrysostom brilliantly writes on this question of why the church accepted four gospels, not just one. Quote, can one evangelist write everything? Of course he could have, but consider this. Four evangelists wrote at different times in different places without talking or agreeing with each other about the, about the contents. And yet they wrote their gospels in such a way that it seems that they, they uttered their words with one mouth. This is a great proof of their truth, end quote. St. John also brilliantly counters the objection that in some elements the, gospel even seems to, the Gospels even seem to contradict each other. Quote, If they were exactly in agreement with each other in every element, concerning times, places, exact words, then the enemies of Christ would never believe that they had, that they had written the Gospels without coming together and agreeing on the contents in advance. Such a prior agreement may have been seen as a, such a prior agreement may have been seen in a pejorative light. But since there are insignificant differences among them, it, rem it removes any doubt about their authenticity and speaks authorita authoritatively if, and speaks authoritatively in favor of the writers. End quote. Blessed Theophylact of Bulgaria argues in a similar vein. Do not tell me that they are not in agreement at all points. Rather, go and look at the moment where they do not agree. Did a single one of them say that Christ was not born? Did one of them say that Christ resurrected, while another said that he did not? God forbid. In the most important and essential, they are all in agreement. Otherwise, people may have thought that they that they were sorry. Otherwise, people may have thought that they wrote the four gospels while meeting together and counselling each other on the writing. But in reality, what one missed, another included, and so it only seems that sometimes they contradict each other. Uh, end quote. From these words, it is clear that the few insignificant differences in the telling of the four evangelists do not speak against the genuineness of the Gospels and instead clearly witness to it. Do we have any questions? Yes. Yes. Um, so I know that in, I have read, I think it was a World Orthodox um, publication, but I don't know exactly where that the papal organization has um, saints and they have those who are not saints but are called blessed but they said that the, or the orthodox church is not so so that the title of blessed does not have to mean that the person is not a saint can you comment on that um, of course in regards to uh, blessed augustine if his grace is still with us, his grace would be the best one to answer that. And here, I'm not really sure I understood the question. Um, um, so, so Aaron's asking about the use of the word, the title blessed. blessed. So, for example, blessed Theophylact and blessed Augustine. What does it mean when we use that title? Um we avoid sometimes giving the title of a saint to someone because immediately when you call somebody a saint you kind of put a, a stamp of approval on everything they've said and written so this blessed is uh, uh, recognition that the person uh, was uh, a god-fearing person um, but not necessarily um, saint material in the case of Augustine, um, his teachings did give birth to um, many of the heresies of the West. Uh, that might not have been his intention, but it happened. So um, we're careful with how we look at him. Aaron, I don't know if I repeated your question properly. Was there a follow-up that you had? Uh, no, no, thank you. Okay, we also have a um, thank you, Constantine. We just seen your message come through on the, the chat. So Constantine said, correct me, Ladika, if I'm wrong. What I was saying is that Origen also proposed the apocathastasis, apocathastasis, that is the fact that due to God's goodness, even the devil would have been eventually forgiven. Is this um, yes, universal the, forgiveness and universal the, salvation? The apocathastasis. Apocatastasis uh, the um in other words, um, the reinstatement of all, 
uh, was basically Origen's problem. And we find it in other saints that corrected it after, like St. Gregory of Nyssa. Um, it started out with a very good theory that um, God was merciful and God is all forgiven, uh, forgiving. And so in the end, um, he'll have to reinstate everything that's fallen. Um, there, there's a mistake in that, though, that um, God gives us our choice. And once we've made our choice and continue to work in that choice, uh, then we're not, um, uh, God's mercy is not going to force us um, to be on the right road again so that we can fall away um, and not everyone will be saved in the end. And that's that's clear in the gospel too, that not everyone will be saved. Uh, it was an attempt to, uh, for Origen to explain God is so merciful that he would save everybody in the end, but it was wrong. Um, is it similar, Yerida, to the way the papists have elevated the Theotokos um, with the Immaculate Conception? I would say that's a different matter, but um, yeah, they try and make everything um, uh, ultra... Um, ultra holy whereas um some things are, are human and some things are, are just the way that god allows them to be so um to believe that the theotokos needed to be born um from uh, a sinless uh relationship um that's trying to add holiness to holiness if i may say that um there was there's nothing unholy about a regular relationship that would bring forth something holy i think it's even more beautiful hmm. your grace mentioned saint gregory of nyssa and that he corrected himself um so is this the rule with and obviously saint gregory of nyssa is a great saint of the church is this the rule, Yerida? We we have many saints in the history of the church who made errors when it came to, to areas of dogma, but is the thing that they all have in common, all of the glorified saints, is that they all uh, repented of their of their errors um, and they repented in a way that was visible to, to the church? Yes, um, we say that to make a mistake um, belongs to humans. Um, but to um, insist upon your um, mistake belongs to the the devil himself. So, um, yes, theological writers, even saints, made some errors. But when they caught them, they corrected them quickly. Right. And there's a, there's a story, um, a, there's an interaction that uh, Ar, the heretic Ar, Aryan had with his mother um, to do with this. Is that correct, Lesputa? Yes. Um, a heretic, for the most part, is a heretic because he won't humble himself ever and he won't um, change what he's saying. Uh, yes, the famous story about Arius is that um, his mother at some point told him, listen, all the fathers of the council can't be making a mistake and you're right. Um, and Arius admitted to her that Yes, they are right, but I can't go back now on what I've already said. Right. Uh, any follow-up from our people? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Aaron, and thank you, Constantine. The meaning of such phrases as the gospel according to Matthew. The word gospel, as we have already seen, means good news in the original Greek, which is why the Slavonic gospels are usually titled, for example, the good news according to Matthew. It must be said, however, that this expression according to is relative. All four Gospels are the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. He himself gives us, through the four evangelists, the joyful news of our salvation. The evangelists are only mediators in the transmission of this good news. This is why the English according to, the English phrase according to, is more proper. The interrelation of the four Gospels according to their content. When considering all four Gospels, 
The content of the first three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, coincides at many points, both in the sequence of events and in the manner of telling. The fourth Gospel of John in this sense stands alone, being significantly different from the first three, both in the events related and the style of writing. Thus, the first three Gospels are generally called the synoptics, from the Greek word synopsis, which means a summary in the same fashion, the same as the Latin word conspectus. But while the first three Gospels are similar to each other both in form and content, which can be easily expressed in parallel tables, they do have their particularities. So, if we use, um, this is going to be, uh, this might be confusing to listen to. So if we use 100% to mean the entire content of all four Gospels, then Matthew's Gospel corresponds to all other evangelists 58% of the time, while 42% of his content is unique. Mark's content agrees with the others 93% of the time, while 7% is unique to his Gospel. Luke has 41% corresponding, 59% unique. John, however, has only 8% correspondence with the other evangelists, and 92% of his Gospel is different from the rest. The corresponding material in all four is generally found in the words of Christ the Saviour. The differences are generally in the narrative sections. When Matthew and Luke literally agree with each other, Mark always agrees with them. There are many more areas of consonance between Luke and Mark than between Luke and Matthew. When Mark has additional material, it generally corresponds to unique material in Luke as well, which is not the case with the unique elements found in the Gospel according to Matthew. Finally, in those cases when Mark is silent, Luke often differs in his account from Matthew. The Synoptic Gospels almost exclusively tell of the Lord Jesus Christ's preaching in Galilee, while St. John speaks almost exclusively about Judea. The Synoptics, for the most part, write about Christ's miracles, parables, and external events in the life of the Lord, while St. John discourses on the deep inner meaning of these events through the words of the Lord on the most exalted subjects of the faith. Despite these differences between the Gospels, they have absolutely no internal contradictions. Attentive reading will reward one, will reward one with clear marks of agreement between the Synoptics and St. John. Thus, St. John speaks little about Christ's Galilean mission, but he doubtless knows of his long sojourns in Galilee. The Synoptics write nothing about the early activity of the Lord in Judea and Jerusalem proper, but there are plenty of internal suggestions of this early preaching. Thus, according to their witness, the Lord had friends, disciples, and followers in Jerusalem, such as the owner of the house where the mystical supper was performed, and Joseph of Arimathea. Especially important in this sense are the words written by the Synoptics, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I wanted to gather your children together, from Matthew chapter 23, words that clearly express Christ's frequent trips to Jerusalem. It is true that the Synoptics do not write of the miracle of Lazarus' resurrection, but Luke knows his sisters in Bethany well, and the clearly described character of them, uh, and the clearly described character of each of them, expressed in very few words, fully corresponds to their characterization as given by St. John. The main difference between the Synoptics and St. John is in the manner of relating Christ's preaching. In the Synoptics, Christ speaks very simply, in a manner easy to understand, in a populist vein. In St. John, Christ speaks about profound and mystical things, often difficult to understand, almost as if they were not intended for the crowd, but rather for a limited circle of listeners. But that is, in fact, but that is in fact the case. The Synoptics relate Christ's preaching to the Galileans, who were simple and ignorant people. St. John, in contrast, relates the words of the Lord directed at the Judeans, the scribes and Pharisees, people who knew the law of Moses well and were, by the standards of that time, quite well educated. In addition, St. John, as we see later, has a special goal, to reveal as completely as possible the teaching of Jesus Christ as the Son of God, and this theme, of course, is much more difficult to understand than the simple and accessible parables of the Synoptics. But even here, there is not a great divergence between the Synoptics and St. John. If the Synoptics show a more human side of Christ, while, while John stresses the divine aspects, this does not mean that the Synoptics do not describe a divine Christ or that John does not show Christ's human side. The Son of Man of the Synoptic Gospels is also the Son of God, to whom is given all authority, both in heaven and on earth, 
In the same way, the Son of God in John is also truly man who accepts the invitation to the wedding feast, who has a friendly conversation with Martha and Mary, and who weeps over the tomb of his friend Lazarus. Not in the least contradicting each other, the synoptics in St. John complement each other, and only in their wholeness do they give the most beautiful and complete image of Christ, how he is understood and preached by his holy church. Now, end of chapter. That will also be where we, uh, our last reading for the night. Um, Adam has um, put a chart on the discussion group. Uh, it's very useful um, because sometimes it's hard to. Yeah. It's hard to understand these things without visualizing. So thank you, Adam. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, before we end the stream, do we have any? Um, while we have, and while we have Vespita on the line, do we have any any general questions? Very good. I think that we even got into or, the subject of origin today was was uh, a big advancement for us to learn um, uh, why the apocatastasis don pandon is um, not a gospel truth and how that somebody from um, from the desire to speak good words about God, because that's what Origen was trying to say, that he was all merciful. Uh, when a balance is missing, that's where heresy begins. Right. Is there anything, is there anything that your grace wants to, before we end the recording, is there anything your grace wants to give our listeners? Um, no, I think we did well tonight. Okay. May we have a, a blessing to end the session? The session? Through the prayers of our Holy Father's Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us. Amen.